Hello there, boys and girls, and all of those in between. My name is Melina Bitchcock, and welcome to Bitch Talk with Bitchcock. I'm so excited that this is our 420 special, and our very special, oh, special guest, all the way from Portland, Oregon, we have the beautiful and high freaking sativa goddamn Joan. Hi, hi, and so am I, everybody. How the fuck we doing? Oh my God, baby, I'm doing fabulous. I'm high as a kite, celebrating 420 as always, even if it is a day late. But how are you doing, my love? Are you surviving quarantine? You know, um, I have been doing my best to survive quarantine, fortunately. You know, I have uh, warm myself up and cozy myself up with a place that has a whole bunch of marijuana. So I'm doing my best and am highly medicated. <laughs> oh my God. I believe in having lots of marijuana also. <sighs> <sighs> well, girl, I'm so excited you're here. We're going to spill all the tea and just have a lot of fun. Um, are you ready to get into the bulk of the interview? Oh my gosh, yes, girl, I am here and ready for it. Well, fantastic, my love. So I really think we should start at the beginning, and is when did you start drag, and actually how long have you been performing? So I started drag um, the first time that I ever, like, came out in um, drag, and I had my vision for Sativa all put together, but it was uh, Pride of 2016. I, like, went out and went to, like, uh, just during Pride, was a Pride queen. And then my first drag performance was President's Day of 2017 at the Not My President's Day show, where um, I made my debut on stage. And it was an incredible fundraiser that said, fuck you to uh, Donald Trump and raised over $3,000 for Planned Parenthood. Yes, that's fucking amazing. And you know, so you came out to do a show, and you said it was Pride. Was there any other reason that really, like, a bug that may have bit you, or any other reasons that made you want to really start drag? Well, I had met my first drag queen um, at, as a young youth at uh, the Smirk Sexual Minorities Youth Resource Center here in Portland. And okay. uh, I met my first queen, and they, they were my, like, best friend. And uh, Anna, shout out to Honest Lynn Valentine, who's still performing in Sickening. But yeah. um, ever since I met them, I kind of fell in love with drag, and there was always a cute scene here in Portland. Um, and then I always loved it and felt like I could do it, but I never really knew what my voice was. Okay. I know. I don't know if you had this process when you started doing drag, but where you kind of try and get everything together and figure out like. I had a long, Yeah, I had more of a long process finding my character. Like, you know, she thought she was going to be an impersonator, and then she thought she was going to be a pretty queen, and then she thought she was just going to be kind of a, a grunge, busted queen, and then she turned into a clown. I love it. I love it. And, you know, some, some people kind of put their balls to the balls and jump in feet first and kind of, like, figure, like, figure it out as we go. We all do, realistically. But I didn't want to start drag unless if I kind of really had like a vision and a voice of like the kind of lane that I wanted to go in. Absolutely. And you know, it sounds like with our pre-interview, you definitely have some great goals and some things that you definitely work for in drag that are very admirable that we'll get to in just a few minutes. But I definitely want to get to know you a little more because you're such a fabulous creature. Um, now, yeah, look at you. <laughs> Well, girl, you know, one thing I was always curious about is, you know, you may be a pot queen, but, and you also have a pot name. You go by Sativa Goddamn Jones. How did you pick that name, my love? Well, you know, I, um, because I do like to leave the couch every now and again, I um, am not the biggest indica smoker. Plus, I smoke to self-medicate for ADD, so anything too depressing makes me, like, anxious and feel like my skin's crawling. So okay. Sativa kind of helps me, like, get my life together, be, like, creative, inspired, and gets to, like, moving and stepping, and it's that energy, girl. It's that one that's going to lift you up. 
So Sativa, anybody who's seen me perform has said goddamn and then Jones, because if you are, according to my friends uh, and how we smoked, anytime you were the last person to uh, hit that butt end of the joint, you were Roach Killer Jones. And I believe in waste not, want not. So I was always the Roach Killer. <laughs> yes, I love it so much. And, you know, you're such a fun queen. And I really love that you just keep it real, definitely with your personality. Now, speaking of personality, why don't you describe your drag personality in three words? Well, I mean, I, my drag personality isn't too different from me, so I'd say probably stupid, dumb, and weird. But yes. <laughs> um, I would say if we wanted more of like a descriptor, like a description and like sativa and like one blurb, it would be uh, Portland's premier crossfade and crossdresser for charity. Okay, I love that so much. And I mean, you said there's not much of a difference between sativa and you in real life. I mean. What are some quirks that Sativa allows you to, you know, do? Well, I, I definitely believe in the power of dragon. Definitely, who doesn't get into all of this when you know you look good and just, you know, you get a little confident and a little, uh. I, see I you don't feel know what right you're now. talking about. Mm, yeah. Uh, mm. You look so good, bitch, by the way. You know I love a good purple-green moment. <laughs> You know, I love this hair. It's locks by Bitchcock and <laughs> giving locks by Lilac a run for her. Actually, no, there's no run for her money. <laughs> but no, thank you. You look fabulous yourself. Speaking of hair, this beautiful big green hair looks stunning on you. Thank you. I um, grew it naturally, right out of um, flawless locks. <laughs> oh, fabulous. So you're one of the chosen few that Lawless has actually made hair for. Yes, I mean, and it took a lot of convincing and some a little bit of guilt. I was like, I miss me, our sister, and I'm supposed to have a step down. Do my hair, bitch. So... <laughs> I love it. I'm your sister. I have to look a certain way. <laughs> well, bitch, you know, one thing I've always been curious is you are kind of a pot themed queen. What made you go with that theme for your character? Well, <clears throat> multitude of reasons. One, weed saved my life from being on like harder, like dumb prescription substances for my ADD is a little bit more of a natural option. But also too, um, for me, when I was picking my name, I always had a goal of being a figure who would lift up and uh, lift up the community and, you know, elevate the community, if you will, <laughs> <laughs> to a different plane of existence, hello. Um, but with weed and especially how uh, the legalization movement that's going on right now it's just a reminder that if we want to see big changes and things shift in our community it always starts from the bottom and works its way up by people coming together and saying like no we've seen that be the case with queer acceptance and that's the case with uh the legalization and really any other like process that you want to see change in the world you have to like start with your community and start at grassroots and build people up grassroots I, it was a fun <laughs> i love it and you're you're tr you're absolutely correct baby i mean weed i mean i remember the day where oh my god i no one can know that i smoke weed and a, a god forbids a cop pull me over with weed on me and now we're in a day and age i mean it, thankfully with p how people have bought p how people have voted you know the relevance people have brought up for marijuana that, you know, we actually have it legal and available for us, especially here in Oregon. Mm -hmm. um, I have tons of anxiety issues myself. Um, and I have troubles dealing with people. So marijuana just makes it a little more easy for me. That's just, I, I fully agree. I, and you know what? I love it too. And let's just be real. People is out here like, they, they, Congress is still making shit for Oxycontin and all of this stuff. And like, who the hell has ever overdosed on some weed? Yeah. I, and I know I've tried. 
we're in the middle of a pandemic right now. Marijuana is safer than hugs, okay? <laughs> uh, uh, that's probably the truest thing I've heard. Oh my God, I'm so stealing that, Sativa. You're welcome. I mean, I'm, I, I saw it from a friend online, and so I'm kind of stealing it too. I'm, oh my oh, God, oh, well, that's all right. We're drag queens. We're known for mopping shit. Um, no. You know, speaking of mopping shit, why don't you talk a little bit about your drag style in this thing? My drag style? Um, well, it's green. <laughs> oh, really? Really? Green? For a pot queen? I wouldn't think. You know, it, it just, it just kind of seems fitting. But, um, I don't know. I feel like a weird bastardization, like, child of, like, if Poison Ivy and the Joker had a child. But <laughs> I, I kind of just go with whatever feeling and whatever fantasy I want to go with. Sometimes it's more of, like, a grungier, like, kind of, like, 90s grunge aesthetic. Or sometimes I want to be glam. And sometimes I want to be as stoned as the dresses I'm wearing. So... <laughs> Yes, I love it. And you know, I love that you mentioned the like 90s grunge aesthetic because that's even something I tend to love because I mean, I'm a child of the 80s and 90s and the, the grunge era was something that was just so influential on you. And it's like, it's also like fashion-y, but also very like comfortable. So... <laughs> And right? you gotta love comfortable as a drag queen. You know, it's always a seldom moment when you get a little bit of comfort in a drag and you better fucking enjoy that shit as long as you get it because it's about gonna be fleeting and last about four seconds. <laughs> I completely agree. You know, if we're not in pain, then we're not doing it right. Is that correct? That's some tea. That's why I'm tucked right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always tucked because I'm a lady. Mm. A woman. Yes, I'm a woman in the words of Kimberly Michelle Westwood. You know what? I like in this flawless logs, I'm feeling I'm feeling like a woman. I get it, Kimberly Michelle Westwood. I'm feeling you right now, bitch. Uh, you know what? I think I can just say it. You look better than Kimberly Michelle Westwood. <laughs> <laughs> As I get a death threat in my phone in just probably like 20 minutes. Well, Lalo, <laughs> tell us a little bit of what we expect from Sativa Goddamn Jones on stage and during a live performance. Well, it kind of depends on what gigorama we're at, just to be real. Like, if we're at like a big like show stopping performance, you can expect like cartwheels, stunts, splits, dips, shablams, the whole shebang. There was actually one time where I dumped an entire pound of sugar on me during a performance at Barbarella. So what? Was, yeah. what was it powdered sugar? Were you like trying to do a cocaine thing or what were you doing, bitch? It was granular sugar. It was for this party that Katya, um, Katya Presents put on uh, called Extra Tasty. And I did this song called Sugar and wound up dumping all of this on me and let me tell you i had danced my ass off i was so fucking sticky afterwards <laughs> oh my god that is some sweet tea right there <laughs> um yeah other things too you can expect like comedic <laughs> perform <coughs> oh good girl. Off the proper way covid19 approved i love it you know, that's how the Obamas told me how to do it. So thank you. <laughs> Doing more than the administration. Fuck. So what are we, to, do you dance? Do you bring comedy? Do you bring high kicks? Tell us a little bit about your performances, bitch. Definitely high kicks. Um, I also have been known to bring the drama sometimes too, as well as a lot of political performances as well that I love to do. Um, the, one of my favorite ones was during Pride. I uh, wound up getting a slot at the block party and we wound up raising money for the Trevor Project. And mm -hmm. I wound up doing Breathe Me by Sia, which I'm sure if you've heard, it just like brings me to tears, just the song itself. 
And then I wound up performing it and I was just feeling it and in that fantasy and then brought out signs for everybody to see at this block party that had the statistics of the prevalence of uh, LG uh, suicide in the LGBTQ youth, where they're like damn near five times more likely to have attempted for like trans adults. Uh, the statistics are even higher and that we, we can help. This is a reality while we're all here celebrating during Pride that like we're here and we're alive and we get to celebrate. There's other people who are struggling and we can do something to make it better and just always remember that there's still so many more people that we can help. Oh, baby, that's so powerful and so true. And I love that younger queens such as yourself really get that because I feel like a lot of kids, I mean, I think they understand pride and I think they, it's a, they understand it's a time to celebrate, but I don't think they always understand the history that comes behind pride. And I think you're definitely one of the, the younger ones who do understand it and the meaning of putting the work and coming in and you know, being there and making awareness for the community, trying to raise money for the charities. Uh, absolutely. And I, I think it's something to respond to something that you said that I believe is super important is that like understanding, you know, the history of pride, right. but also let's just be real for a second. Let's understand the history of drag and what drag has meant for the queer community. There was a time where it was illegal to do drag. They would arrest you for dressing as any anything other any other gender than what you were assigned at birth and it was illegal and drag and drag and drag performances as well as um trans people were on the forefront of creating this queer movement that give gave us the rights to date drag queens have always been the figures and staples in the community that drive us forward and help, are at the front lines to help Absolutely, darling. As I've always said, I always consider drag queens kind of cheerleaders for the queer community. And, you know, I think everything you said is really true. And, you know, a lot of the kids, like you said, they don't understand when the times it was illegal to be gay or what it was. You could, I'm like, I was interviewing Nikki Antelage from Portland, which I know you know, and she was telling us, isn't she fabulous? But she was telling us about the older days when you had to literally wear three articles of men's clothing at the same t at all times, even in drag, where you could literally be, you know, hauled off to jail. And that's something our generation doesn't understand. And it, that's definitely the history behind some of this stuff and, you know, why we celebrate pride. Um, so again, there's a lot of history. Those kids should definitely look into queer history because there's a lot to learn from Stonewall, from Pride, to drag history, to what's hiding in Sativa's undergarments. It's furry. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. Now, speaking of furry, do you ever bring comedy to the stage, Sativa? Um, I've been known to do um, a few dumb and comedic numbers. Uh, oh, I... I don't know. I feel like I'm kind of just such a kooky person to begin with. And I love some like physical comedy and sometimes taking things that aren't like, aren't necessarily like inherently funny songs on their own, but embodying them in a way and interacting with an audience that like creates like a connection that just like everything looks good. And then it's just really off for a minute and you're like, ah, <laughs> Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. I'm high. <laughs> well, we're always high, honey. It's Oregon. It's legal here. We're allowed to smoke the devil's lettuce. The devil's lettuce. Yes, with a little bit of semen on top. Mwah. <clears throat> well, my love, you know, I also know that you're known to host shows from time to time. What is your personality like on the microphone? Well, normally my like main hosting gig is with Dirty Bingo. So it's like a sex positive bingo. So I get to be a little bit more funny, a little crass, a little sexy, very flirtatious with the audience there because you know, they're having a sex positive bingo. 
But um, there's other things that I've hosted, like the Not My President's Day show, that's a lot more of a political thing. And I've spoken on the mic about like, what's going on in politics in our community, like why we need to register for the census, why you need to be counted for the census and why we need to stand up for our trans community and what like, what we need to focus on to make shit better. And we're all there. And so sometimes I get a little political. Sometimes it's real sexy, honey. Other times when I'm like hosting a drag race viewing, it's more just kind of funny bantering back and forth. But okay, what is always like a good time? <laughs> oh, I bet it's always a good time. What is like a sexy sativa like? Do you ever come out like a G string and a bra and just feel your Britney fantasy? Mm. You know, I uh, I wouldn't say I haven't yet, but I would say that I don't necessarily need to dress in like a bra and a thong to like feel my sexy sluttiness. Once again, I like to, you know, feel the physicality of it all. So you'll know. Okay, I feel it, bitch. I feel it. At least I, oh yeah, I think I'm feeling it. Oh. Well, love, you know, I always wondered, because you are a marijuana queen, as I've mentioned, and we can tell by the green hair. Um, yeah. Have you ever done the crazy act of actually smoking weed during a performance? What do you, what's your guess, sis? Well, it's you, so I want to say fuck yes. You, ding, 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 ding. You are correct. Uh, yeah, I actually have uh, definitely smoked weed during a live performance. Not at um, a bar, because I do have an LCC, and I would like to be able to keep that for when the bar is open to be able to serve alcohol. Okay. But, um, I wound up having this really, really cool opportunity with uh, Kiara Cortez and uh, Kwanzaa Fusion Shade down in Salem, Oregon. And they had put together this drag show at a weed lodge. Now, have you heard of a weed lodge? Not really. The closest thing I ever did was like there was a clubhouse and they would give like dab shots and stuff like that, but no weed lodge. Okay, so it's probably kind of similar to what you're talking about, but like to the nth degree, girl. Ooh. It was like an Elks Lodge type of situation where you walk in and they had bongs, pipes, papers to like roll, pretty much like bring, like bring your own weed. You can smoke it here. They had the dab rigs, everything. Different levels, a bingo hall. Downstairs, there was like a room with a giant couch and video games where some guy was definitely on too many edibles and passed out, as well as a fucking food, co- a food cart. I live. So, oh my gosh. So they had this drag show in the bingo hall portion of this place, and the entire audience is just there, joints in hand, passing pipes, doing everything, and just ready for a fucking drag show. And so, yeah, while I was performing, I definitely got past a few joints and was token, 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 and lip syncing, lip syncing, lip syncing, and collecting those dollars too, honey. <laughs> yes, I love it. You know, I've been known to being out here in Oregon, and everyone knows I smoke weed because I love the feeling of being high. Um, have you ever been tipped weed? Yes. Oh yeah. my God, isn't that wonderful when that happens? I live for it because... I used to do that when I lived in Long Beach. I would go to the drag shows with my friends and we would, like, right before we'd go, we'd, like, roll joints and allegedly, this is all allegedly, okay? Right. We we would take, like, roll some joints, roll them in the dollar bills, and then when the girls would come by, like, we would tip them with, like, a dollar bill with, like, a little joint in it. And so I've definitely been tipped in joints, um, jars of weed, (laughs) blunts and then i've had people literally while i'm like performing just come up and hand me loose nugs oh i've had that happen yeah <laughs> and like i have nowhere to put this and i'm like i could hide it into my wig but then i would never find it so no it usually goes in my titties 
I don't, and I don't have those, so it just I'm like, well, thanks. <laughs> wow, as well endowed girl. If you're going to like, if you're going to a place and you want to intentionally tip queens and weed, take the little bit of time with some rolling papers and just roll them up and then roll it into a dollar bill. It makes the transaction a little bit easier and a lot less obscene and less sketch. Yes, I love it. Tip from Sativa. <laughs> Well, this thing, let's get a little more serious. So, again, you're a fabulous queen, and you're definitely a sweetheart. I always love being around you. I love hanging out with you at shows, especially when we sneak away and get high. Yes. So, you know, I love the moment with Miss Bitchcock by the, uh, out past the back patio by that dumpster girl. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> Melina Bitchcock's usually by the dumpster. What can I say? <laughs> But if she's not hitting the pipe, she's sucking it. <laughs> I don't know how to disagree with that. So, hey. <laughs> Listen, well, there's no, no shame. No shame. And it's never, a, it's never a walk of shame. Always a, or a walk of shame is always a stride of pride. Damn right. And we'll definitely talk about my sluttiness a little later in there. Um, so, my love. Actually, let's get a little more serious and talk about who's actually helped inspire your drag character. Has there been any icons or any like TV show reality characters or people in real life that's really helped inspire you? You know, my whole like my whole weird aesthetic has been pulled from like so many different like other drag performers. Like clearly, like. Laganja was an influence as well as like had a lettuce and stuff when it came to like looks and aesthetics, let's just be real. Um, but it, for me, it's less about like the looks of everything sometimes too. It's more about like, you know, and your actions speak louder than words or like an Instagram picture. So when I look at that, I will think Flawless Shade, my, like, sis my sweetheart sister and uh, my drag family, Miss Flawless Shade is absolutely a huge, huge influence and has inspired and helped me so greatly through these three years of doing drag. Fucking love me some Flawless Shade. And again, her name is the perfect name for her because there's no other description for her but Flawless. She's always so beautiful, always so creative. And if you haven't yet, go check out the episode where I actually interviewed the one and only Flawless Shade here on Bitch Talk with Bitchcock. But of course, after you watch this episode. Absolutely. And you can hear it there first that I am a better performer than her. <laughs> oh, yeah. She did admit that, didn't she? You know, everybody has different reasons of getting into drag. For Flawless, she was always a makeup girl and like, was like a model look and was fabulous and a wonderful MC. For me, it was more like I'm a good, I love to perform and be on stage with people and that I wanted to give back to the community. So the only reason why I have like a face that relatively looks like this is from Flawless, kind of like nudging me every <laughs> so often, like, well, maybe you should try this with your makeup. You might look a little less busted. <laughs> And, you know, you two kind of are adorable, I have to say. I was going through your Facebook, and I've known you guys both for about a year and a half. And you guys are so cute as best friends. It feels like you guys have known each other forever. And you seem like those best friends that probably talk every single fucking day. Oh, 100%. Like, I pretty much talk to her damn near every day during this quarantine. She, She's just, you know... I, I'm a huge believer in we don't get to pick our relatives, right? Mm -hmm. Like relatives are people that we we just get. But you know, and sometimes we're lucky and those relatives are family, but relatives are not always our family, and family is not always our relatives. She is definitely family to me and chosen family. I love that. So she's a true drag sister through and through. And I think that's important. My drag sister is literally uh, my best friend, um, and I've known them from high school since, and they were actually, you know them, they were my emperor, um, Hunter Down Knightley, but they are literally my best friend, my drag sister. I talk to them every single day. Um, I think oh this God, relationship... 
Go ahead, baby. Oh, I was like, so you got to be a lucky person who loved, like, was best friends with their emperor while they reign? That was probably the smartest move that I thought we made was we chose people to reign with that we actually could stand being around and that we know even if this motherfucker pisses me off, I'm going to be over it in like 25 minutes. So, yeah, I was lucky enough to have him. But I think those kind of relationships, especially in drag, are important because you have someone who's either an equal or who does maybe something a little bit different in the same um, performance style. But they always want to help uplift each other. And that's the thing I've noticed about, like, two drag queens being best friends. They want to, even if one drag queen is, like, flawless shade where she's fucking perfect and nothing cracks that face she still wants to see everyone around her uplifted and i think that's beautiful to have that friendship with her bitch i am super super blessed for it and once again i feel like we have a really good like reciprocity because the things that like motivate me with drag like i've watched her become a, a much like stronger performance like mm -hmm. performer through our like friendship and I feel like my makeup game has gone pretty fly like it's not it's not the best best but I've gotten pretty fly at this face so <laughs> and a oh. lot of that from her. I do yeah. want to give a shout out to one more queen while we're still on who inspires me if that's okay real fast girl no, it's not. How fucking dare you <laughs> ask to talk about who inspires you? Go ahead. I mean, how dare me be inspired by anyone? But <laughs> <laughs> um, I also want to give a huge shout out to uh, Jules, Jules of Long Beach. She is a queen in that community that um, I became very close to before I had even started drag. But she is just a huge example of being a strong staple in the community. She hosts gigs and does so many different fundraisers that raise money for the different organizations that the community needs and does so much work in not only Long Beach, but throughout the state of California that she's been recognized by the governor. She has the key to the city. And even now during quarantine, she's still putting on shows and keeping people entertained and is just a beacon a beacon of light in their community and so i look up to them so so very much oh my god that's fabulous you know aren't those wonderful queens who are making online content like god sends straight from heaven wouldn't you say you know i might only because i've you know recorded a few things myself but <laughs> you know, i know what you're talking about once in a while i record a tiktok a TikTok girl. I know I'm coming up in the world. Yes, girl. You you better you better give Shima a run for her money, okay? I mean, uh, honey, she must never TikTok. run in her life. Sorry, what? I said, honey, she must never run in her life. You know, I would laugh at that, but that bitch beat me at like. <laughs> That bitch beat me once. For How? The sea arts. Yeah. Like, I we, <laughs> I ran against her for the sea arts, and that bitch beat me the first time I ran. So, <laughs> and I still don't ever hear the end of it, even though. <laughs> oh, no. No, no, no. You don't lose to a bitch. That bitch will hold it against you for the rest of your life. So, speaking of some of these Portland bitches, why don't you tell me a little bit about the Portland drag scene? Ooh, the Portland drag scene. Hmm. You know, I I will say this about the Portland drag scene is that there are a fuck ton of entertainers, fuck ton of like incredible drag performances, and not just queens, but also incredible like non-binary performers, uh, mask performers, and everywhere in between. There is just so many talented artists in Portland, and there's a lot of kind of different boroughs in the city where you go, you can find different uh, spectrums of drag throughout the city where it's like you can see more like kind of gothic and um, like gothic type drag to like really kitschy and dramatic and campy drag to like show stopping performances as well. And it's really nice because even though there's a whole bunch of people, there's still kind of pockets and niches for what kind of inspires you, but it's still incredibly competitive. 
I love it. Where, what kind of section do you fit in in all of that? Because again, there are so many sections. I feel like you're kind of a chameleon. You could probably fit in any of them. I mean, I just kind of show up high and hang out. <laughs> Girl, <laughs> this is why I love you. You're a queen after my own heart. I mean, the one thing that I love is if I know Sativa Goddamn Jones is going to be at a show, I'm like, well, at least I have someone I'm going to be able to smoke with and be dumb with. And, you know, if I feel like I just can't take the audience and I need to just smoke, I'll be like, we're just going to disappear for 20 minutes. Okay, I'm just going to be honest. Half of the fun of the drag show is smoking and drinking with the queens afterwards. Hello. If you're not, like, yeah. once again, too, this is, like, a note for, like, new queens, too, who, like, kind of get into this drag race out where they, like, show up, do the gig, like, lip sync, do their, like, get their money and, like, wipe everything off and then just leave. Bitch, right. you are missing out on literally some of the most fun of drag, which is getting to, like, meet the people and the community and get to mingle with them. Make sure, like, and as much as it gives to your fans and the audience, it rewards you so much, too. So, like, it is. And it's part of your job. I mean, that is actually part of your job to meet the audience and mingle with the audience and take those pictures. You know, I think what you're saying also is you should stay afterwards and party with your sisters because that literally is when the exciting things happen because i i'll say anytime i've stayed at the bar afterwards there's always a guy that comes up and flirts with us or there's a crazy thing that happens or crazy drunk person takes off their clothes i mean there's fun things that happen after hours and amen and you know what i i don't know about you what's going on down there but everybody there's all, so many drag brunch is important too and i like my first cast spot on any show was a drag brunch um shout out to alexis gamble star would testify a drag brunch but i would get i would get done with the brunch gig and it would be like 2 30 ish and i would stay out and drag until that night i was like i'm gonna get my money's worth out of this makeup and you know what i'm gonna have fun with as many fucking people as i can I'm going to take photos, no matter how busted my makeup gets throughout all of it. I'm just going to have fun. And I love that. you meet so many cool people along the way. Honey, I love that you have that mentality and drag. And I, I think that really what makes you a people person and what makes you so easy to talk to. I mean, some of these queens, it, it's kind of, you kind of get scared to approach them. I like to see queens like you where it makes it easy to want to come up to you and just be like, hey, bitch, what are you doing? What's smokable? Hey, Amen, girl. And you know what? I love being, I love being that person. Like, one, I, I feel like I just kind of am that person and that spirit anyway. But also, you, you never know who was going through anything else, like what's going on in somebody else's life. And I've had beautiful moments where I've gotten like messages after literally being done with the gig, just getting off, feeling co like cocky, confident, sexy, and it's like, mm, I'm gonna go outside, have this bowl, Mary. And somebody is like, oh my God, I love your performance. I'm like, bitch, I'm gonna go smoke a bowl. You wanna come with me? Let's go. And we wind up getting out there, we smoke. Um, I do this thing where anytime I smoke a bowl with somebody, if I give, like, I try and give them greens and ask one thing that they're blessed for. And do, you know, a little cute, little weed ritual shit. But I've gotten messages afterwards where, and I don't think anything of it, this is just, you know, me going through my little day-to-day -day stoner life, like, just got off stage, and I need to go smoke a bowl. Okay, cool. Hey, you want to come with me? Cool, let's smoke. Talk a little bit. All right, going back in. Need to change my wig and do this next number, right? <laughs> I get messages, like, the next day where they're like, I'm, like, new to Portland, and I, like, nobody's like really reached out or talked to me and I just needed that so much or I had this going on in my life and just being able to like talk to you about it last night like meant the world to me and at the end of the day no matter what fucking crazy nonsense and bullshit's going on in my life like that is the reason why we do this it is like from those moments and those connections and as much as it's about you in drag it's a hundred times more what it is for everybody else uh, yeah, absolutely, baby. Uh, I think that is very well spoken. And, you know, I'll say that that kind of interaction is one reason that really pulled me into you is, you know, I get very 
awkward around people, especially in areas I'm not familiar with. And whenever I come up to Portland, I don't necessarily know everyone. And some people, I'm not necessarily sure who's going to be friendly and who's not. Now, you're one of those few people up there who instantly made it feel safe to come up. And like, I think at one moment you even saw, okay, Melina, you look a little like tense or uncomfortable. Do you want to go smoke a bowl? And you, you actually like really provide almost a safe moment for the queens when there's that high tension, high motion of a show going on. You know what? I thank you, <laughs> thank you. I I really try and try my best to be somebody who's just like a good Judy to all of my sisters anytime I can be, or to anyone for that matter. I I like to believe my mama raised me right, but um, <clears throat> yeah, that, that's just super cool. And thank you. Uh, I try my damnedest to be sweet, kind to everybody I meet, and give people the time and day in this like their space. Oh, baby, that's, I think that's really wonderful. Again, that's one of the main reasons why I fucking adore the shit out of you. Now, speaking of some of these bitches out in Portland, besides Flawless, because you've already told how much you love her, who do you really love to work with? Oh, gosh. Um, I will say, so, I used to do this show at Tonic Lounge before it shut down which was the coolest show. It was a show that was being put on by Queens, ran by Queens, 100% where, like, we just kept this space going. It was so cool. So I got to work every single Thursday with Diana Fire from Camp Wanakiki. Ah, yes! Shout out to her, who's also, I, I don't know if y'all know this. I mean, probably you watch Camp Wanakiki. That bitch is a huge stoner. Huge stoner. Oh, yes. That's good to know. Like, um, she keeps up with me, girl. Oh, yes. I actually have a great funny story about her. Um, she came to Eugene once, and I said her name wrong on the microphone because I was hosting, and I called her Diana Day. And I come backstage, and she's like, is Diana fired? Like, Diana fired? Like, what's going to happen to you if you say my name wrong again? You know what? And I completely believe it because that bitch is a Scorpio. <laughs> uh, I loved it, though. She's such a fucking amazing bitch. And I love that she actually represented um, Portland. Her and Claire represented Portland for Camp Wanakiki Season 2. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and Claire apparently not only representing Portland, but also representing um, like trans representation in drag, too, which oh. is so incredible. Because, I mean, let's just be real. We can't even get, like, trans fans on Drag Race. Right. <laughs> Meanwhile, Camp on Kiki has somebody who is a drag queen who's also, like, a trans man. Like, mm -hmm. and let's talk about that diversity in our community because it doesn't get shown as frequently as, like, right. cis white bullshit. It's true. I mean, the RuPaul Nation where they just want the white drag queen fantasy, blonde hair, blue eyed, tall, long legs. I mean, it, it it's boring and it's nice to see things like Camp Wanakiki and Dragula who are welcoming drag kings, um, born female gender trans performers, all all spectrums of the queer or drag umbrella. And I think that's really important. And it's something that drag race should definitely hop on board with because, I mean, they're going to get left behind because, you know, Camp One and Kiki is getting ready to go on their third season. Um, Dragula is going to keep going because, and they're going to keep showing that platform where they're going to welcome everyone. And drag race is just going to be that prudish fucking drag show. Well, it it definitely appears that way. I I have a weird question about this though, because okay. I, I I once again I see it also being broken down into like sections as well too, and we kind of acknowledge some of the history in our community, right? right. For instance, Darcells in here in Portland, which is the oldest drag bar in the nation, and she's the oldest drag queen in the world who's still working. Mm -hmm. Still, you know, what, what they do in their 
definition of what they put on stage is female impersonation, which is, you know, in itself its own, like, specific style and kind of drag, where, you know, they're looking for a certain specific type of entertainer versus, you know, other venues that are going to have more, like, weird and maybe non non-traditional forms of drag. I, I don't know if there's a way of, I, I don't know whether or not drag race is going to be able to like market and just put in that word, this one thing, or if they're going to have to expand with the times or if they want to like try and play off of like a more traditional style of drag pageant, I guess. Yeah, I mean, everything's getting evolved, but again, as, other shows like Camp Wanna Kiki and Dragula keep progressing and keep featuring those, you know, important um, entertainers who are trans or drag king or born female. I think those are going to show that it's more and more acceptable. And, you know, again, Drag Race will have to make a decision. Now, yeah. my love, one thing I really would like to know is now you do quite a few shows and one thing that you've mentioned before that you do a regular show called Dirty Fingo. Tell yeah. me a little bit about that. So Dirty Bingo um, is a sex positive bingo that I host at three different locations throughout the city when quarantine isn't happening normally. Um, the Nest Lounge in Southeast Portland on Belmont scandals in southwest portland as well as um the cruise room annex in northeast portland so we have different spots where you can come check us out but we play a sexy dirty version of bingo so rather than b-i-n-g-o it's d-i-r-t-y and rather than numbers it's like one the cards have different categories so one's like sex positions so it'd be like d reverse cowgirl or you know Ooh. we have one that are like penis reference which is like oh johnson which is something i might yell out regularly <laughs> um but yeah we have a whole bunch of different ones like for a whole bunch of genitalia sexual positions kink toys everything and it's always just a good laugh and i host it with um a couple of like guest guest queens so we always get to have a little bit of like that kiki banner between me and another local girl and I get to kind of pry into their sex life a little bit and find out what what makes them blush because some of, it gets pretty dirty and pretty sexy very quick. I mean I, I bet some of these butt plugs as prices. Oh my and I bet some of these queens are scandalous and there's not a lot of things you can do to make them blush. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know any girls like that, Melina. Can you point one out to me? <laughs> well, I'll just say I'm a proud slut. Hallelujah. Well, you know what, girl? The next, when we get out of this quarantine and everything, I'm going to get your ass up to Portland to do a dirty bingo with me. How about that? I would love that. I actually have a lot of very sex-positive performances that I would love to bring in future. Yes. So, my love, so... Dirty Bingo, I mean, it has to be a very fun event where crazy things probably would tend to happen, especially on stage during performances. What's one of the craziest things you may have done in drag? In drag? Uh, yeah. Oh, gosh, craziest things I've done in drag. Ooh. Um... Oh gosh, are we talking like sex? Are we talking like being a drunk fool? Because there was definitely like, <laughs> I, I, I might have to plead the fifth on some of these things so they don't want to like incriminate myself. Well, let's yeah. talk about being a fool so you don't have to incriminate yourself too much. Oh, being a fool. I mean, I will say that I'm definitely known for, you know, getting a little drunk and feeling my fantasy and definitely doing some cartwheels and <laughs> some dramatic dips in the middle of the bar for no damn reason and just feeling my fantasy wherever the fuck I'm at. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, honey. It's always something good to feel your fantasy. Mm, yes. Mm, I mean, yeah. 
my friends get like I, sometimes I get a little drunk and um, a song will come on at the club and I'll like be feeling it and I'm like ah oh, ah. Oh and like be whipping my hair and lip syncing at my friends and they're trying to have like an actual conversation with me and it's just <laughs> <laughs> bitch well you've done some fantastic things throughout your drag career one thing that i think we should definitely talk about is the fact that your face was actually on a label of a fucking wine so you actually had a wine label with your face on it is that correct Yes, through Cooper's Hall PDX, it was a rosé of Pinot Noir. So, oh my gosh, tell us a little bit about that experience and how that happened. So, it was super, super cool. Um, I have a friend who uh, I have a connection to, Cooper's Hall, who reached out and said, Cooper's Hall wants to do a pride bottle that goes back to the Trevor Project, which is a organization that provides a 24 hour uh, queer youth suicide hotline and a whole bunch of resources for suicide prevention as well as crisis intervention for queer youth, which is a huge organization that I support 100%. So they reached out and I'm already like, fuck yeah, I love the Trevor Project. And they were like, we're going to sell this bottle throughout Pride at all of these things. and we would like you to be on there because we know how much you do for charity and we would like you to pick another queen to be on there with you. And so I wound up, um, at the time I was our Miss Sweetheart of Portland, Miss Sweetheart 31. And I went with my beautiful Rose Empress of my like friend and the beautiful Rose Empress at the time, Kimberly Michelle Westwood. Rose oh, Empress. her, that bitch. I know, that beautiful, horrible hooker. Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh, but you both look so amazing. I think Kimberly had this like stunning red moment where she had roses and then you had this beautiful like green hair. Yeah, it, I mean, one, I was nervous as fuck about that entire thing because I like, one, I was having a horrible makeup day and nothing was working for me. Have you ever, have you had one of those? Probably never because you look stunning. <laughs> Well, you know what? Believe it or not, I do. There, no matter how talented you, you are or how much you think you know what you're doing, there's going to be days where that fucking makeup's going to fight against you. And believe me, thankfully today's not one of them. <laughs> no. So I was having one of those days. And so I was like, nothing with makeup was working right. I wound up like <laughs> running a little bit late. And I show up and there's Kimberly, a woman. <laughs> beautiful bitch, that bitch. <laughs> and I'm like okay whatever I'm like she's gonna I'm I'm gonna look heinous next to her on this bottle but um I don't know who photoshopped it but I wound up looking just as pretty as that bitch on there and what I loved about it is when you put the two bottles together it creates a rainbow she's like on the red spectrum with like the purples reds and golds, and then it goes into like greens and blues and yellows on my mind Oh, I do love that. And how how much money did that whole um campaign actually raise? Um I want I'd have to go back and like dig through my emails to remember. I believe the there's still a couple of bottles like in remote places in Portland still that I'm trying to hunt down. But there's the last total was like a thousand three hundred maybe more than that. I would have to double check, but I know that it was over a thousand dollars was raised for the Trevor Project through that. I think that is fucking amazing, darling. And you know. yeah, so and in fact, didn't you get that opportunity because you were recently Miss Sweetheart of Portland, correct? Yes, that is correct. Um, I well, thank you. what. Well, baby, tell us a little bit about that experience as Miss Sweetheart. Oh my gosh. Miss Sweetheart, for me personally, was an absolute dream come true. It's, for, for those who don't know, the Sweethearts organization has been around for now 32 years. We just crowned our new Miss Sweetheart. Shout out to Rogue Storm Safari. Yes. But um, 32 years ago, we started off and we kind of branched off in as like, 
a unique but separate extension of the like Rose Court in our own way that was devoted purely to giving back and focusing on the needs of our community and giving, yeah, giving back, raising money and doing a whole bunch of charity work that needed to happen in our community. And for me, I had started drawing and was raising money and trying to put on events I would give back to the community. And so everything just lined up and I found the Sweethearts and it was phenomenal like there wasn't a better match of like a way to represent the community and be able to spend an entire year where a hundred percent of like anything that you did with this organization went back and you had this long line of people to support you it was so cool and throughout that year i wound up raising over fifteen thousand dollars for different oh. nonprofits with my mister oh my gosh that's ex exciting bitch that's a lot of money yep. i'm i'm pretty i'm pretty pleased with myself it's a it's a cute little coin <laughs> absolutely now tell us a little bit how the miss sweethearts actually um kind of set up, are set apart from the ir i'm sorry the isrc because you get you said it's kind of a little bit of a it branched off from that but how does it kind of set apart so it branches off for me a little bit. The ISRC um, started and has really values a lot of their traditions and playing the roles of um, emperor and empress. And they still do a plenty of work in the community, but out, out of its base and start, it was about like, you know, these like playing face and showing up and being like present and like looked at and going to all of these different right. cities. And you know, this is like, who's coming out of Portland, which is really wonderful and I'm not gonna boot it at all. The Sweethearts are focused more of staying in your community and making sure that you are there and raising the money, doing the gigs, volunteering your time and focusing on how to give back and what needs need to be met. So throughout my year, I was able to focus on creating space for queer youth and maintaining a safe space for queer youth uh veterans we raise money for veterans for Planned Parenthood for uh the Q Center here in Portland as well as um one of my favorites which was for Rainbow Railroad which helps out queer um immigrants who are coming from countries that it is illegal for them to be um open and live their truth and so they're an organization that is working to Trans get these people out of these dangerous situations and into countries that will respect their human rights and um, dignity. So it, for me, it was just a really, really awesome moment to see what I feel like I could leave a mark and stamp on my community. I share a history with plenty of other incredible queens like Bolivia Carmichael's, uh, Flawless Shade, Rogue Safari, and um, a whole, whole, whole bunch more. But really, it's that kind of history we were talking about of queens who are devoted to serving their community and simply raising money. Absolutely. And it's really wonderful to hear all you've done. You know, it sounds like quite a big job to step in that role. What made you actually want to step into that position, Sativa? For, for me... For me, it was just everything lined up. I was already kind of doing what the what the requirements of the title were. So, you know, sometimes I, I feel like sometimes people will run for these like titles and they they want a sparkly hat, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. where it's more about, you know, the status and everything. For me, it was a title that spoke to exactly what I was doing and would make my platform a little bit larger for me to be able to do more work with it, which was really cool. And that's why I, um, I wound up running for it. I lost to Shima the first time I, Shima B. Valentine, the first time I ran. And that then bitch. I came back with a different fire under my ass and won and represented Portland for a year. But yeah. Biggest, been fantastic. Oh, sorry, what? You've been so fantastic during your year. Well, thank you. I, I'd like to believe that I've represented to my, the best ability. My, my favorite thing about the Sweethearts 
for me though too is the process that you go to be to become a sweetheart rather than it being like a voted campaign or you have to impress like a panel of like a couple of judges it comes down to being the best the baddest bitch at fundraising so you get three weeks and they give you these raffle tickets and they say you want to become Miss sweetheart we have this charity that you're raising money for here's three weeks whoever raises the most fucking money will be the one to represent and do this throughout an entire year so i love that um i mean I, I was doing pretty damn well when I lost to Shima the first time, but this last time I ran, I wound up campaigning, and in a three-week period of time, I raised close, like, I was just shy of $4,000 in three weeks. Oh, fuck yes, bitch. So, it's- would you consider Sativa a charity queen at all? I would not disagree with that title of a charity queen. I, I try to be a little humble uh, every now and again. <laughs> But yeah, I, I would say that I have a huge focus on the community and things that are going on that are just larger than, you know, me showing up and lip singing for a gig for, you know, a few bucks so I can pay my phone bill. Absolutely. In fact, why don't you tell us a little bit what working for your community actually means to you, my love? So... I mean, the community gives me so much. Like, let's just be real for a second. It's not that I, like, $15,000 this one year is a whole lot, and I've raised a whole bunch more in the other two years of drug that I was doing before Miss Sweetheart. But for me, what's always trippy about it is that I, like, I don't have a lot of money. I, like, I'm not, like, making bank or anything. I help out my family, and I had my, like, day job as a server, which, you know, gave me... A, a position of privilege for me to have an income other than drag where I could use drag to you know raise money for a charity if I chose to do that but all of the money that I've raised throughout my career hasn't been you know from me personally sure like uh, every now and again I like throw in some dollars to like boost what I'm doing but all of that money has come back from the community in in so many different ways where if you perform and you have that stage and that platform, you get like, let's say four to five minutes. What are you going to say to that audience? And for me, it was, let's speak to the things that are going on in our community. Let's speak to the fact that like, there, trans people are facing ex- exorbitant amounts of violence. Let's, let's address that. How can we like, you know, make a little bit of change and progress right now by one, being aware of it and then giving a dollar or two to do something about it. Different, different performances like that to, you know, remind people. And if you give people the opportunity to do the right thing, I am kind of an optimist in the way where I believe they will do the right thing and help you out in that. I fully agree, baby. Um, I think a lot of people have really good hearts. And as much as there's some bitchy or awful people out there, um, for every one of those awful people, there are 20 fabulous, amazing people with kind hearts that want to help uplift others. And, you know, it seems like you're definitely one of those beautiful people that love to uplift your community. And I really admire your hard work because a lot of younger queens, again, it's easy to get focused on trying to earn the coin, but it's nice to turn you know, turn the cheek and kind of take care of your community who takes care of you because without your community, there's, there's no one. And, you know, those people are who make you feel safe. Those people are the ones who tip you and support you. So I love that you actually support them also, my love. Absolutely. Absolutely. It has been a firm belief of mine that um, if, if the community gives you the platform, that you have every obligation to use that platform to give back to them. Absolutely. And speaking of, why don't you tell me a little bit, because I know you love to work with queer youth. Why don't you tell us a little bit about working with queer youth and what that does mean to you also? So for me, um, a, an organization that I've really focused on personally it means the world to me and it's smirk is the sexual um and gender minorities youth resource center here in portland and the best way to kind of describe what they would do in like layman's terms would 
be something similar to like a boys and girls club where they also provide like drop-in space for queer youth to like hang out and be with each other in like a safe environment and like not like out on the streets or around a whole bunch of mess safe positive environment that also provides like resources to help them with schooling with housing with mental health everything it's such a cool cool organization and for me, I came out in eighth grade. I was 13 years old when I came out. And unfortunately, the queer community, a lot of our spaces for queer people are centered around bars, which are 21 plus. So there's a whole demographic of young people and young queer people who are coming out younger and younger that don't really have the same space and community that is there that you know older queer people get. So Smirk provides a space for all of these youth, and that was actually where I met Onyx Lynn Valentine, my um, my my best one, of, like my best friend during childhood, and my like first queen that I ever met. And so it's a cool cathartic moment to make sure that I'm maintaining that space that I needed when I was a youth, that I'm keeping that there for the next generation of queer people who are coming up, and. Also, on top of that, being able to uh, self fundraise by um, self fundraise by committing to you know a chunk of time where all of my tips are going to go back to Smirk, so I can take the youth out ice skating or to Oaks Park and create safe spaces and fun spaces where they don't have to worry about it or like need anything to show up and and be able to enjoy their time that we're able to provide that for them. I mean, that's wonderful. In fact, I hear every year, like you said, you raise money to take those kids out ice skating and you make sure to raise that money yourself so you can make sure those kids come out and they also get to skate with beautiful drag queens. Yes, I have been skating with the queens um, at the Lloyd Center Ice Rink around the holidays now for three years with uh, the Smirk Youth. And for me, it's kind of like doing like my own like little take on Lent, if you will. Like, I I smoke cigarettes. I know you're not supposed to. Don't smoke. I'm not like a great influence. I'm just you know a good one sometimes. But um, so in November, I would quit drinking and I would quit smoking. And for me, I was like, that's gonna save me money. Where I like, if I quit drinking and quit smoking, I have like my like serving job and then I can just use all of the money that I get from drag as an extra income that I can give back to make sure that I can pay for these youth to go out because you know it's not only just like providing the space but it's making sure that it's, it's accessible and a lot of queer youth struggle economically and with housing and so to be able to make sure that they can just show up and know that they're taken care of and their community's got them and that they get to like have a beautiful fun moment for the holidays is everything. And so far every year I've been able to raise more money than it takes to pay for the youth, which we've had over 30 youth show up at least the last two years where I'm still able to donate money back to the organization that takes care of them on a day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week basis. Yes, girl, get it. I love all this work that you're doing for your community. You are a true charity queen, and I love it. You definitely know how to give back. Now, would you ever say that having these titles or, you know, being Miss Sweetheart ever kept you from being crazy or maybe true to yourself as Sativa? I would say yes and no. Um, I would say it doesn't necessarily has ever imposed on how I've acted or behave. I feel like once again, my actions speak for themselves and I'm still gonna be a kooky ass stoner queen who doesn't mind going to the back alley behind the bar and smoking goddamn joint, like, you know, between numbers. I'm gonna be that girl and listen, I like, I may not be the most perfect person in the world, but I still am able to give back and be able to do some good in the world, all right? So I wouldn't say that I've necessarily changed. I would say the only thing that really kind of shifted was being on social media and realizing that I can't just like run my mouth or like say things like this because not only am I representing myself, which needs to be taken seriously as a queen, 
because you know your your reputation is your brand and your brand is your job so that's everything right and on top of that is that even if something might be on brand for sativa it might not necessarily represent the sweethearts in the best light so you know there's a little there's a little things of just being professional and realizing that once again we're not doing this for my own gain all the time i get enough out of drive by doing it a whole bunch but at the end of the day it's not doing it for what i want and what i get out of it it's ultimately i'm here for everyone else and like to you know what the the vibe and the energy that when i get to see you at a gig is what matters to me more well and i think what also what you know there's always going to be a balance that you have to learn especially when you're representing an organization along with yourself as a queen um, when i was empress i had to definitely learn how to put aside the craziness that is melina bitchcock and learn to be regal but still stay true to my character and it's a balance you just have to learn to do. And sometimes it can be challenging, but it's something we can all do. You just kind of have to read your audience and know what's appropriate to bring to that show. A hundred percent. I mean, like, I, I tried to be the sweetest of people as a sweetheart, but sometimes I'm an honest person and I call it as I see it. And sometimes it's just not okay. And I've absolutely spoken my mind and have been unapologetic in that. And it hasn't always ruffled everyone's feathers in the right way, but also at the end of the day, I was put in this position because I was the baddest bitch to do it, and I'm here, I do it well, and we we can disagree on a whole lot of things, but you are not going to be able to ever disagree on that $15,000 that I've raised back for our community. Yes, get it, Miss Thing. I love you so much. Now, Sativa, how would you say that drag has actually affected your everyday real life? You know, I would say that it's on the real. I started drag because I was so frustrated and afraid by what was going on in the world, especially around the 2016 election, where I had so much passion and frustration, and I, know, I knew that the world should be better. And I just felt like I didn't have any opportunity or like any way for it to like really matter. For me, Sativa and drag has been an opportunity to give myself the space and platform to actually speak out and follow through with rather than just griping and feeling like angsty about it. It actually gives me a lane and opportunity to give back and do some work on the issues that are really important to me which I don't I feel like that. I would have the same voice as just Jared. I don't feel like I necessarily change a whole bunch between the two. I feel that the way that I'm listened to and treated by other people shifts. I get that. I definitely get that. Now, uh, yeah, I mean, it's funny the power of drag, how funny where most people won't notice you or won't listen to you the moment you put on that dress and wig all of a sudden everyone wants to be around you and everyone wants to hear hang on every word you say right have you ever had that moment where you've met somebody in drag a couple of times and they always come up and they're like oh girl hey like hey melina it's so good to see you like blah 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 and then when you're out of the club and you're not engaged and you say hi to them they look at you and go all the time because I'm an awkward looking boy and I don't look anything like what I do as Melina. I, I would say you're still a handsome boy. Let's not get it twisted, okay? <laughs> oh, thank you, my love. I, I'm not awful, but I definitely look different as Melina. People always, I go up to say hi to them and they'll be like, who the fuck are you? And I'll be like, honey, it's Bitchcock. And they're like, girl! <laughs> yeah i i've had that happen quite a few well, times to me too so it, it's always a little bit funny and it's like for me i mean i guess i do drag so much where you kind of forget that there is a difference because you're just 
going through it all the damn time. And those little moments are kind of a reminder of how things are different. Yeah. So, honey, I kind of want to dive a little more in your personal life, if you don't mind. Um, I know you have a boyfriend, is that correct? Oh, yes. After being a single wretched hag for almost all of her 20s, she's, she's <laughs> nailed one down. <laughs> oh, yeah. She's feeling her out. I love it. And how does he support your drag? You know, I am so blessed. He has been beyond supportive. But he's also a huge fan of drag, too. We actually met at Barbarella PDX here um, at a Katya Presents thing with, um, it was at Extra Tasty when I dumped all of that sugar all over my body and I was looking sexy, sticky, and sweet. He yeah. was in the audience because he's a big fan of Kimchi who, who, from RuPaul's Drag Race, who was also performing that night. But we wound up seeing each other in the audience and we wound up talking and having some like little googly eyes and I was like, okay, well, I'm on four edibles and I have to go perform now, bye. And <laughs> we wound up performing, but there was this moment and I still remember it and I haven't really told him about this, so. Because I like to pretend that, you know, I, I like to pretend that I'm hard to get. <laughs> Uh, most important is it's not tea but um, there was a moment where I saw him while I was performing and I was walking through the audience and we were like face to face and I like looked at him and then I like jumped and landed in the splits and I could see when I got up that his jaw had completely dropped and that was it and he wound up finding, following me on Instagram and there was like a tagged photo and I went up messaging him and I was like hey we're really cute can I take you on a date and then it was like fuck I don't have any boy photos and I was like this is what I look like as a boy if that matters and <sighs> oh my god I love that <laughs> well it's funny I uh, met my boyfriend who I have who um, we're almost going on five years, but he met Melina before he met Jamie. And um, he, all he knew was this crazy, over-the-top, loud drag queen. And he was like, well, maybe I met a friend. And he kind of wanted to get to know me as a person. And then I was like, he came to one of our court shows or something. And uh, I remember he was hanging out with me. And I'm like, so, can I take you on a date, ho-ho? And he let me take him on a date, and I convinced him I was a cute boy, and I've been with him five years now. You better get a girl. Gotta love a queen with a cute boyfriend. Too. That's some shit. What was that, babe? Oh, I said congratulations on five years, girl, too. That's some shit. Thank you. I am definitely a queen for life. Um, if I find a cute boy that I love, I will jump on his shoulders and stay with him forever. Well, I'm just saying that you don't get the 501k if they break up with you, girl. So <laughs> you better love them till they dead. <laughs> <laughs> Truth. No, love, he loves drag. He supports you. How has drag ever affected your relationship? You know, I will say that it gets a little tricky sometimes. He's in law school, so he's he's really busy trying to become a lawyer. A lawyer, Mary. And I'm like, I don't have a ring on this finger. I just have a Oh, big my God. Your mother one. would be so proud. Yes. Uh, oh, God. His mother is so proud. But um, so he's in law school and really, really busy with that. And so a lot of his classes are in the morning. And even with quarantine, it's still, like, during the day. But there were times where... Uh, I would be performing and he would literally be at like the upper levels of Barbarella, like studying, <laughs> like doing schoolwork, like at the club, like, like club ass music playing, like drag queens. And then there's this like sweet, handsome man with like a law school book, just, you know, reading up on a property law and what happens if you need it, like how to protect tenants if they need to be evicted. <laughs> He's handsome and he's smart, bitch. You better hold on to that one. Oh, and it gets even better, girl. Let me tell you this. Before he was in law school, he was working as an artist and at, like working as an artist and is so uh, politically active and is like such an incredible activist too. So 
you know, my little heart melts oh. because, you know, we have that little activist soul together. Oh, I love it. Now, you mentioned he's kind of an artist. Have you actually, especially with quarantine happening, have you thought about putting him in drag yet? So we've talked about it, and um, I believe we might do something. There's projects coming in the works, but I don't think we're going to do femme drag at all. It's going to be some, I'm going to try like doing like mask drag with him. Oh. He's a little bit more comfortable with the mask drag. Okay. I, I, I'm excited to see what happens. Now, speaking of makeup and the process that happens to become beautiful, Sativa, honey, tell me a little bit the process you go through to become this beautiful creature. Oh, you mean all this? Yeah. Um, I mean, to get this look, it's just a little mascara. It goes such a long way. You forgot the lip gloss. The lip gloss, fuck! Um, <laughs> completely kidding. So usually my process, give or take, it's like around like two to like two to three hours, give or take. Okay. And usually um, I like, Glue down your brows. Figure out how to glue down your brows, girls, but get them down. So it takes like forever on that. And then I usually do like my base contour foundation, everything, then brows, then eyes. And No, absolutely. And you know, makeup can be troubling from time to time and it takes a lot of learning and we all evolve. And speaking of evolving, why don't you tell me a little bit how Sativa has actually evolved within the last three years? Oh gosh, well, um, I will just say that I went into this with a big heart, a lot of ambition, and um, was able to be a good performer. I'm still not like the best with hair or like sewing or anything, but I'm starting to like pull myself together and feel like a more well-rounded queen. And makeup, especially makeup, was not one of the strong suits of me going into this and fortunately I've just stuck with it and gone at it and I have had beautiful beautiful help from incredibly talented makeup artists like Flawless. I love it and now my love I, we're at a certain part of the um, interview where I thought because you're such a fabulous weed queen we would do a set of questions that I call stoner questions. Stoner questions. You got you there, sis. Uh-oh. <coughs> Uh-oh. Well, if it's still recording, this is the full look. Green shoes and all.
Hello, Miss Sativa. Oh my God, are you back, sis? I am back, my love. Hello. Uh, you so Look at those rhinestones. Oh yes, go up. You get the full look now, sis. Oh, and you want to know the best part? Yes. The <sighs> You crazy bitch, you're actually wearing heels. Oh my gosh. And they're green. Yes. Well, Sativa, we're almost done with the interview, my love. I promise. I hope we don't have any more technical difficulties. Fuck the internet. The stinky difficulties, it's fine. <laughs> Testicle difficulties. <laughs> So, love, this next set of questions, because you're a stoner queen herself, I thought we would ask you a set of stoner questions. Yes. This is what I came for, darling. Perfect. So, honey, if you were asked to name a strain of weed after your drag persona, what would you name it? Oh, if I could name, what would I name it? Oh, God. It's so, this is so tricky because I'm like already named after weed, so I have to name a weed after me that's not already weed's name. Which, I would call it infinity, girl. Infinity. It goes to infinity and beyond. Ooh, I love it. I'd also call it maybe the goddamn Jones Experience. Not to be confer not to be confused with Stephanie Nicole Aria Mercury experience, okay? Well, that's a completely different high love. That is some tea. <laughs> <laughs> While stoned, how many pizzas have you consumed in one sitting? Oh wow. Well, you know what? There's no shame in my game, okay? And uh, mama mama was a hungry, hungry girl. All right. And she was very stoned and she was home by herself and it was payday and she was feeling good and wanted to treat herself, right? Mm -hmm. So I wound up ordering like four large stuffed crust pizzas from Pizza Hut. Yes. <laughs> so something about the stuffed crust. I don't know. I was always a fan from like a kid as the 90s with the like when they came out with it and they had all of those like janky commercials of people eating pizza backwards and never did that. I'm not crazy, but I loved it. And stuff crust is where it's at. So I got high. I didn't quite down all four of them in one sitting, but I made it through like three and a half. Oh my God, you fucking bitch. And how the fuck are you so skinny? I boop a lot. <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> well, Maybe not, and <laughs> uh, so, have you ever forgotten the lyrics from your performance because you were so stoned? Oh gosh. Um, normally when I'm perform, I I pride myself on performances, girl. Uh, I am usually like a hundred percent on top of it, like ninety seven percent of the time. So. Um, I will say during this quarantine, though, I've been recording different uh, digital performances for these, like, online drag shows, and it's a little bit different of a beast because, you know, you're doing multiple takes of the same song, and I've been smoking weed throughout all of them, and so sometimes there was one moment, and actually it's on the uh, performance I did of High Road by Kesha for the 420 edition of Drama Camp, Produced by Rogue Storm Safari. Um, there's a moment, you can maybe catch it if you're real good, where I 
do a turn and I like hit this blunt and the minute I hit that and I like inhale and I'm turning and I blow it out and go, what fucking verse am I on? <laughs> and oh. turn around and like hear it and then I was like, okay, and I go back into it and was fine ever since. But I feel like it's just tricky now because you are like listening to the same song so many times and performing it and getting different angles and all sorts of shit. Yes. All right. Well, baby, tell me who your favorite queen to smoke weed with is. Oh, gosh. Okay. So, one, I love smoking weed, smoking weed with uh, any queen, any queen, anywhere, anytime. So, put that out there. Um, and I love uh, so many different friends in Portland, like Flawless, Out of Summer Gardens, Kiara Cortez, Elia Lore whole bunch of different stoners out here in Portland that I live for. But I will say that my favorite smoking experience, I, Ursula Major, any time, like any and every time I've ever smoked with Ursula Major is just such a fucking blast. Oh my god, so Ursula Major from season one of Dragula, correct? Yes, 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 yes. Um, I've been lucky and fortunate enough um to be like ish <laughs> be like decent friends and very good acquaintances with coco jim holiday and diana fire from camp on and sometimes planets align and there's been a couple of moments where i've gotten to smoke with ursula major and she is by far one of the kindest fucking queens in the entire biz so kind yeah. that bitch gives me a run for run for my money that bitch oh. some, some goddamn herb. Good to know. Well, perfect, baby. We're going to keep this interview going. We're actually close to the end. So what's something that you actually hope to do in drag? You know, before this whole quarantine thing went down, I my goal for this year was to be able to like travel more and like perform some places outside of Portland. I didn't get to really like go on any vacations or travel much with Miss Sweetheart since I was in Portland doing all of these events throughout the year where I was hoping that I would be able to start doing different performances outside of Portland and get to see new places and meet new people and maybe make a new fan or two. Oh, okay. Well, speaking of traveling, a little birdie told me you actually performed all the way out in California, out in Long Beach. Is that correct? Yes. Um, I, so I lived in Long Beach like um, a few years ago and came back to Portland uh, to like be closer and supportive to family. But um, I wound up going down there for a friend's wedding and I met, messaged Jules, Jules of Long Beach, who I talked about earlier. I was like, hey girl, like, I'm coming down, like, I'm coming down, my other good Judy, uh, my other good drag Judy's coming down, and um, we were just wondering, like, what's the opportunity that you might be able to sneak us in for a, like, gig somewhere? And she was like, okay, well, uh, I can get you in for one number at Hamburger Mary's Long Beach this night. And um, it was so cool to like go down there and perform uh, for like my friends who have like hadn't seen me in a couple of years and I had been working on drag because um, I started drag after I had moved back to Portland. And it was really cool. I fucking pulled out like outfit reveal, wig reveal, stunts, every like the stops. Um, I. Chugged a bong, I chugged bong water on stage during that performance. Wait, you drank bong water? Yes, girl. I, I had a bong at, like, one point. I, like, pulled out and did a fake bong rip. But, but um, there was definitely, like, water, like, there was definitely some, like, liquid that was bong water that I definitely uh, chugged on stage. And it was, like, it was just such a cool performance. Um, I, the energy and vibe was so cool and I just felt so validated that like, you know, outside of my city and my community that like, you know, loves me because I see them every day that, you know, I can go somewhere else and still do like a show-stopping performance. It was the coolest. 
Yes, get it. Now, I also heard, for me to be a little shady, that you actually may have gotten abandoned in California after that show. Is that correct? Yes, yes, we'll go into it. I also, I just want to put a shout out that if you want to see that performance too, I have all that performance listed in my Instagram, so check it out. But the tea about that is um, I had planned on going back with my good drag Judy in her car and paying her gas, like paying a portion of the gas money. And that is not what happened. I definitely... um, Made some choices, wound up skinny dipping with a hot guy, leaving my phone by the pool and passing out at his place, and um, did not meet the call time to get in that ride back with her. So I wound up getting a plane to come home. Oh my gosh, girl! The tea of it all, but what happens when you go chasing dick, right? I mean, do I regret it? No. No. <laughs> Us queens never regret chasing dick. Once again, you know, it was a, it was a moment where I was like, well, fuck, girl, you, <laughs> this bitch left. But I'm like, you know, I, was I upset with it in the moment? 100%. Was I a saint? Nope. Was I upset with any of the choices that I made? Absolutely not. And you know what? That uh, stride of pride back uh, a thousand miles home was a little bit more expensive than anticipated. <laughs> <laughs> hey, at least you got an extra day in California, right? Yeah, bitch. It was sunny and wonderful. I was living, girl. <laughs> well, perfect. So, Sativa, what are we to expect next from Sativa Goddamn Jones once quarantine opens up? Well, after this quarantine, I'm hoping to go back to doing my dirty bingos all over the place. You'll uh, be catching me doing performances wherever I can get onto a stage because, God, I miss it so much. And oh. in the meantime, follow me on Instagram. I'll be putting up uh, digital performances that I've been recording during quarantine, as well as maybe a throwback or two to some that were recorded before all of this nonsense went down. Oh, I definitely. So definitely follow her on Instagram, boys and girls, and all those in between. And are you posting any of this on TikTok or Facebook also? Um, on Facebook, I haven't gotten on TikTok yet. I haven't been convinced. I'm not. What? Girl, even an old queen like me is on TikTok. I hear that, but you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you a little bit of tea. So, like. There's a whole lot of questions that are going on about the privacy, the data privacy on TikTok because it's like, own, like, is a Chinese thing. So the Chinese government has access to all of that data. So I, I, I don't know. Like, I'm like, there's the cookies on my computer already know too damn much. So. <laughs> Perfect. So would you expect to go on any platform like Dragula, Camp on a Kiki, or RuPaul's Drag Race at all? You know, I wouldn't say no to the opportunity. I think it would be a lot of fun to do any slash all. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't think that it's necessary to be able to are necessary to do to feel like you are successful and can make a difference in the world. So, you know, if the opportunity presented itself, but for me, I also think about it this way, where it's like, I would prefer to lip sync for your life, but I love the challenges of like Camp on a Kiki. But I also, I also am not opposed to the whole like fear factor, crazy things with Dragula. And also, oh. I I feel like Camp on a Kiki, you have to be so nice to each other. And sometimes my like humor is just very honest, very crass and very dry. I like, well, I, have to I, commit, I, I want to commit to being a high person, not like a like, raw raw bitch who's not going to tell you like the tea and listen, the tea is if you're being a bitch, I'm going to tell you you're a bitch. <laughs> like, Hey, comedy's not always about being kiki and, oh my god, I love you. It's Comedy's all portion. Sometimes it's shady, sometimes it's silly, sometimes it's goofy. So I hope being a, being a mean bitch does not keep you from getting on the show. Otherwise, fuck, I'm screwed. 
<laughs> Why am I in love? As long as you have that campy, can do attitude, girl. Oh, honey, I have so much camp, it will just mm, titillate you. <laughs> and we know that you can do. <sighs> oh, I have that camp, can do yeah. attitude. Speaking of my love, can you tell me a little bit about one of your favorite memories working with me? With you. Okay, so I just have to, one, I have to bring it up because you're the one who posted this, girl. Let's just be real. When you won that giant wooden penis bong oh. at Tonic Lounge, and you posted this photo of like me fitting it like that Kimberly Michelle Westwood's just feeding it to me. So, did you like unhinged your jaw? Because that thing literally is thicker than my wrist. And you fucking got it inside your mouth. And? <laughs> yeah? I won it. And you know what's funny? I didn't even win that. It was like one of the older queens in Portland, Miss Helen Heels, who actually won it. But what's that bitch going to do with a giant dick? I, I don't know. But uh, during quarantine, there might be an OnlyFans to find out. Yeah, just to say you don't want to smoke off of that bomb. Mm -mm. <laughs> Does it hit a little too good? Mm, it hits just right. Ooh. So, my love, tell us all here, how did you enjoy your experience on Bitch Talk with Bitchcock? You know, I am just so blessed to have had this opportunity with you, and I'm so fucking proud of you, girl. Can we just give a minute? And everybody who's watching this, you know, like, give it up to fucking Miss Bitchcock here for taking her time, busting her ass to provide everybody some good entertainment. And you do it so professionally and so beautifully. You truly are an inspiration, girl. Thank you. And thank oh, you. Oh, baby, thank you so much. I really do appreciate all those kind words. This is a lot of hard work and it's very stressful at times. And fuck it, while we're spilling the tea, Let's just talk about it, Sativa. We actually had to film this episode twice now. And, wow. you know, the power of fucking tech. But, honey, we're professionals. We make it happen. And I'm so fucking happy you're here. Well, thank you. Honestly, it was the silver lining is that we got to get stoned as fuck together twice as much as we had anticipated, okay? Yes. And you know what? We're just celebrating 420 a little longer. You know what? 420 is this whole month, baby. Yes. So, boys and girls and all those in between, if you have been enjoying Bitch Talk with Bitchcock with the one and only Sativa Goddamn Jones, please look in the description where you can find her PayPal, Vimo, and Cash App so you can tip this bitch. It's hard times, everyone. So if you can tip anything, it's definitely appreciated. If you'd also like to tip me for all my hard work putting together Bitch Talk with Bitchcock, you can also find my PayPal, Vimo, and Cash App information down there also. I do enjoy a good tip as long with the whole thing. <laughs> so, Miss Sativa, um, I am so happy to say that you survived the main interview. But yeah. I do have a little game I'd like to play. <gasps> Games? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So we usually do a little game called Truth or Drink. But in the honor of 420, we're going to do a game called Truth or Smoke. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. I have a little dab rig set up, so I'm ready. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you a series of shady questions, and you're going to either answer them truthfully, or you can take a hit. Okay, Miss Thing? And let's start off with have you ever hooked up or had sex? in drag uh yeah absolutely <laughs> <laughs> who hasn't i mean are we like are we talking about like which time <laughs> <laughs> that's the tea right there i mean i can't even remember how many times i've done it in drag i oof. 
Yeah. I mean, I, I will say that probably the most like memorable and or scandalous one was one time where um, I was Ubering home with my friend after this party. We get, the goal was, I was like, I had cash, but I didn't have the money in my account to like pay for the Uber home. Anyway, we get the Uber to my friend's place and I was going to pay for an Uber from my friends to like me, right? Ooh. This man was super kind. I was in my full like fantasy, like, you know, feeling it, right? And we wind up talking and this man has this beautiful thick Irish accent and we dropped my friend off and he was like, well, hey, like, you know, don't worry about turning it on. I'll just like give you a ride home, blah, blah, blah. And so we like wind up talking and he winds up like, do you want to come sit up? Like, he was like, can I like suck your dick? <laughs> Pretty much is how it went down. It was like, so let me get this straight. You're not charging me for this Uber and like you want to suck my dick out of this? It sounded like too good of a deal to say no to, girl. Yes! You know, that's hot. I've always wanted to live the Uber driver fantasy, so that's sexy! He had that, like, he had that Irish accent, like, it was hard to say no. And also, once again, I was like, you're not gonna smear or smudge my makeup, and, like, you wanna, like, suck me and, like, suck me off and make me come? Absolutely, I'm sorry that has been tucked all night and probably smells weird, but if you want to do that, I'm not gonna. Come, on. Okay. Come on, corn chip dick. <laughs> all right, baby. What is the grossest thing you have ever done on stage? So, that gig I was talking to you about at, um, at Salem at that weed lodge, right? Yeah. And this like 420 mix up has this stuff where, you know, I chug the bong water, right? Well, usually I'm doing it at a bar and, you know, there's these different like regulations and loopholes you kind of have to jump through. Very seldomly is it actual like dirty bong water that I've been using to smoke, right? Well, at this venue, they had these uh, rent a bongs from the bar, and while I was performing, I hit one and then chugged the bong water from the rent a bong from the bar. Ooh, wait, real bong water? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's gross! I was committed to the character and the fantasy, and but also what. Real tea, though. Drunk people are gross, and when I drink bong water in front of drunk people, they're like, yeah! I was doing this at the Weed Lodge. They were interacting with the Queen so much more politely and respectfully than drunk people, one, but two, were just utterly horrified when I drank bong water, and were like... Yeah, because we know what that water comes from! Ugh. Oh, and it smells so awful. I, oh, girl, that's, that's some daring shit to do on stage. Oh, hi. So, what fellow drag queen would you want to have a kai kai with? Who, out of like anyone in general or like out of like a local queen? Let's just say in general, why not? Okay, well, just based off of the images I've seen floating around online and also by their fucking face, uh, Cameron Michaels. Hello. Oh, yes. I've seen some pictures of some, you know, naughty bits. And oh, God. That's a penis. That, that no, that's a cock. That's a cock, Maury. Was it, is it a bitch cock, though? Mm, I would sure like to make it a bitch cock. <laughs> oh my god well honey i'm gonna ask you one more question and then we're gonna say our goodbyes Aww. let's see yeah i know let me find a really good one here actually i'm gonna ask you two more questions just because i'm feeling shady okay okay 
Now, tell us the worst performance flop that has ever happened to you. And performance flops are where your wig falls off, a titty falls out, you fall on your face. Tell us a horror story. Oh, God. So I did this political number at Drama Camp, which is um, the show I'm on cast on, right? And I was uh, doing this number about, like, pretty much hopefully to inspire people to remind and register people to vote. Uh, fun fact, 43% of eligible Americans did not vote in the 2016 election. So, cool. <laughs> yeah, that's some real tea. And actually still one in five uh, LGBT Americans aren't registered to vote either as of like November of last year. Are you fucking kidding me? That's some real tea. So, I mean, one, register to vote. It's not that fucking hard. And we live in Oregon. They mail you a ballot. It's real easy. So there's no excuse here. But um, I was doing this number to let people know how to register to vote. And um, I had these signs and posters. And I had a poster that I had, like, fucked up on and, like, meant to, like, throw out. But still wound up in the pile of posters that I grabbed when I was rushing to the gig. So I'm, like, doing this, like, inspirational political number, right? And it has, like, panels, like, 43% of, like, Americans are not registered to vote. Like, new poster. Like, blah, blah, blah. This is how you're going to vote. Boom. And then, like, the last poster, which is, like, how you're supposed to, like, do anything about it, wound up being that fucked up poster that I messed up on instead of the right one. And it was... I wound up having that one still, but people were like, what was the fucking last poster, Sativa? Your high ass put up the wrong one. (laughs) Oh my gosh. That's fantastic. Well, Sativa, I have one last shady question. Okay. I know there is an image of you floating around Facebook. And if I am not mistaken, you're covered in oil and you are wrestling a big sexy burly man tell me about that image yes where you at where you at naked where you at not naked i was covered in butter um (laughs) yeah so i wound up winning um katya presents does this party every year called butter up and i am your butter up champion of 2019 which means I was in a butter wrestling tournament and out wrestled three hoes to become the champion. And that last um, competitor was uh, Freddie Hollywood, who is fine as hell, let me tell you. Yeah, right. And I mean, I wouldn't mind being like lubed up and pinned down again. But um, I will say that the smell of butter is. Heinous. I managed to keep my wig on the entire time too, which is probably why I won. But that wig still smells like butter. Oh my god, yo! But since I know you want the real tea about it, we're at this venue, and so all of these, we went up in the finale with me and Freddie, and we're there, and like, all of these other contestants have had the time to wash off. So there's like one shower, we're covered in butter, it's cold, all of the water has run out. We end up sharing the shower together to get all of the butter oil off before going home. Uh, oh my God, but I guess you were a complete lady, correct? Absolutely, I'm a respectful, classy gal and I don't kiss and tell them this if you're at my dirty bingo, so we'll see. Ah, don't worry, hon- no, honey, no one's watching this show. There's no film in these cameras. Well, I'm so happy to announce that you survived for a second time Bitch Talk with Bitchcock. And I'm so happy you came here and have been patient with me as we got this interview going. Sativa, you're such a fabulous queen, and I'm so happy to call you a sister. Thank you again for coming on Bitch Talk. Thank you so much for having me. I love you so damn much. And uh, can you shine in your like bright light in the world, girl? Because we're here and we're living for it. All right, sis? I 
Thank you so much, baby. And if all of you lovely, beautiful creatures out there are enjoying Bitch Talk with Bitchcock, please tune in for our next episode tomorrow, the 22nd, as I interview the beautiful Alexandria Hunt. And we have so much tea that we're going to spill. Again, if you enjoyed this interview of Bitch Talk, please go to the description where you can find Miss Sativa da Goddamn Jones's PayPal and Vimo information so you can tip that bitch. Now, boys and girls, a little announcement that I have to make just because I am a merch queen and I have to sell my merch. If you like to support Melina Bitchcock in these hard times and you like to buy some merch, I have some fabulous stickers for $5 a piece. We have a Bitch Talk with Bitchcock sticker. We have two fabulous illustrations of Melina Bitchcock. They are $5 a piece or all three for $13. So again, if you'd like to get a sticker, just send me a private message. And I am so excited that we have some amazing things happening. So again, tune in to the next episode of Bitch Talk with Bitchcock. Sativa Goddamn Jones, I love you so much, baby. And thank you for coming on my show. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I love you. Yes, I love you all, everyone out there. I hope you have a fun and safe week. And we love you so much. Mwah.